Hello and welcome to Food Tech 101. Now, we've been getting to know each other quite well over the last year and a half since I set up Food Tech 101. I mean, we've shared lots of different recipes. I mean, there's, uh, there's well over 50, 60 recipes, videos on Food Tech 101 now. And we've, we've gone through a bit of stuff. We've gone from one or two subscribers now. We're at about, I think, 1,500 subscribers, thereabouts. And we're about to break through and get up to like 10,000 within the next month or two. Uh, I'm going to share something special with you today. This recipe I'm going to share with you today and the technique and the ingredients, simple ingredients, but the method helps produce the softest wholemeal bread in the world. Before we get started, just do me a quick favour. Click that subscribe button and hit that little bell icon so you'll be the first to know whenever I upload a new video. Okay, let's get to it. The thing with, with wholemeal bread is that oftentimes people see it as like the thing you should do when you're being good. You want the white bread because it's soft and it's nice, it's fluffy, but you oh, should be getting more fiber and, and nutrients in, so I'll, I'll have the wholemeal bread, but no. So I'm gonna show you a method today of how to make wholemeal bread so it's super soft and light and fluffy. I'm gonna talk through the ingredients and some, in, some unusual ones which I might use, I'll tell you why I'm using them and how they contribute towards this super light loaf. So let me just talk you through our ingredients. First off, we've got four cups, four of the 600 grams of wholemeal flour. This is a very fine wholemeal flour. Next, we're gonna have 50 grams of soft brown sugar, a teaspoonful and a half of salt, some dried yeast. Each sachet is seven grams. 50 grams of margarine. For this one, I'm using Vitalite, which is a vegan margarine. 500 mils of water and a spoonful and two spoonfuls of white vinegar. The first part of this process is really quite simple. I'm just going to add in uh, the sugar. Next, I'm going to add in the yeast. Again, I'm just putting all the, all the ingredients together. I'm going to add in a teaspoonful and a half of salt. Give that a bit of a mix to begin with, just to kind of integrate. Next, I'm going to add my vinegar straight into the actual water itself. So it's two spoonfuls. Fat in. And to begin with, I pour the water in and I'm going to get my hand in straight away. So I'm just going to get my hand. I'm just going to start squeezing all the ingredients together. Now you don't see many recipes where they're using this particular technique, but it's nice, it's fun, it's nice, it's warm. Grab the fat and you squeeze it through. So I'm just kind of grabbing, as you can see, I'm just grabbing and squeezing. Just like that. Now as you can see, it doesn't look an awful lot like bread dough at the moment, but trust me, stay with it and we'll get there. So I'm just grabbing and squeezing and rotating. And we have what looks more like a thick batter than anything that resembles a bread dough. But this is only the first part of the magical stage. So grab, squeeze, grab, squeeze, grab, squeeze, grab, squeeze. And all my ingredients are now fully in integrated and my hand looks like it's made of glue. So next, I'm gonna scrape my hand clean a little bit. Now our recipe calls for about four cups of flour, which is about 600 grams. This is our last 150. But what I find is if you put all the flour in at one time and dump all the water and mix together, if it's not quite right, you, there's nowhere else to go. If, it's, you, if you've got too much flour, then it's difficult to add the water and get it integrated properly. If it's, if it's not enough flour, then when you're rolling it out, you may end up adding another half a cup or a cup, which changes the consistency. This way, this technique I'm using, you can add just as much flour as you need to get the consistency of dough you need. So to begin with, my final cup, I'm gonna sprinkle a bit in, and then I'm gonna work that in. And what the flour does, it'll start to soak up the liquid, and then within a couple of kneads, we're starting to get something that already starts to look a bit more like a dough. 
a bit more flour in. I find doing it this way, adding just as much flour in a really nice controlled kind of way. And if, whilst doing this, you end up with a nice soft non-sticky mixture before you've added, added all the flour, fine, then just stop. The reason why this is a better method is because all flours don't absorb water at exactly the same rate. So even, so all wholemeal flours aren't the same, um, uh, all white flours aren't the same. So depending on what kind of flour you might have, it may absorb water at a different ratio. So you may have a recipe that says four cups of flour, 500 mils of water, etc. But as you're doing it, you may find that it's too sticky or it's not, or it's, or it's too dry. This way, you can add in just enough water to get the consistent, just enough flour, sorry, to get the consistency you want, and then you can stop. Now we're looking for a nice, soft, stretchy consistency, but we do not want it to be too dry. So I'm just gonna need a little bit more in here. And already, it's moved from a sticky dough, sticky mess, to something that looks a lot more like a dough. Kneading method wise, as you're watching, I'm taking from the bottom, flipping over, pressing down with this part of my hand. You can do a lot of kneading in the bowl to begin with. I'm just gonna put a touch more flour in. Now it's very important we don't add too much flour because if you add too much flour, that's just gonna make our, make our dough, instead of being nice and soft, start being dry. But as we knead it, as you press it out, all the water squeezes out towards the surface and that's what gets sticky. So again, so, in this, so now I've nearly added, there's not much flour left, I've nearly added the final cup, but, it's, but I've added it in a very, very controlled kind of way. And now I've got a nice soft pliable dough and it's ready to turn out onto my table to continue kneading. So remains of my flour now, I sprinkle my flour on the table and now the serious kneading begins. Flour contains two proteins, one's called glutenin and one's called gliadin. And when we knead, we combine those two proteins to make one protein called, you guessed it, gluten. So the more you knead, the more you combine those proteins together. And gluten, gluten is stretchy like an elastic band. And that's what gives the bread its ability to be able to rise and stretch and hold its shape. If the flour had no gluten in it, then it wouldn't have the ability to stretch and the dough would be very, very dense. So the more you knead, the more the gluten is developed. So now we have to take our time and knead this dough. There's no real technique to kneading. Everyone's got their own. As long as you can press down, stretch it out, bring it back together again, and then keep repeating until your mixture is nice and soft and smooth, that's good enough for me. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna knead this bread for about a good 10 minutes. And then we'll come back and see what it's looking like. So here is our dough. Nice, you feel how soft and pliable it is. It's a beautiful dough. It's, look closely, you can see how smooth it is. So we've got a nice, soft, smooth, pliable dough. If your mixture, even before it's allowed to prove, is stiff and dry, then you're gonna get a stiff, dry bread. There's no two ways about it. And you can't really add any additional water at this stage. So you can't, if your bread's too dry now, then it's gonna be a dry bread. Still good to eat, stick it in toaster, whatever. Don't waste it. But if it's dry now, it's gonna be dry when it comes out of the oven. And once it's, at, once it's you're fully integrated and it's fully kneaded, you can't really add additional water again after that. You just end up with a sloppy mess. So our dough needs to be soft and pliable. That's why it's so important when we're kneading it that we just add in a touch of flour, just enough to stop it from sticking. We don't dump a whole load of flour in, just a little touch at a time, just stop it from sticking while we're kneading it. That way we're putting the minimum amount of flour and we keep the dough lovely and soft. This is a beautiful, soft, pliable dough. So I'm gonna dump it in this bowl and I'll leave it, I'm gonna cover it with a, um, with a damp cloth which helps create a humidity, which helps it to rise. Uh, and then come back, maybe an hour, hour and a half. And we're back. So let's just see if our dough is doubled in size. Whoa, look at that. Beautiful. 
Now I'm going to do what we call knocking it back. Now I'll explain before I do it why you knock something back. Now if I was just going to do a quick breath myself, oftentimes I just need it, put it where it's going to, on the tray where it's going to bake or in a, in a dish, um, in a tin and bake it the one time. But I find that if you let it rise, prove as it's done now, it's doubled in size, slightly more than doubled in size, and you knock it back and then you give it a, a light knead and then let it improve a second time. I find sometimes you can get large pockets of air inside that when you bake, you, you, sometimes you ever cut a bread open, you cut it open and it looks like it's really light and fluffy but it's like a big hole in it. This helps give it a much more even uh, distribution of the air inside the dough. And I also find that doing it this way helps make the bread last soft, stay soft a little bit longer. So whereas if you prove it once, it may stay good for a day or so and start to get a little bit hard. I find or have found that when you prove it twice, it stays softer for longer. So let's knock it back and see what happens. It's gonna... See the air shrinking out of it. I'm just gonna take it now, take it out. I'm not going to really need it so much this time round. I'm just going to really more gather it together. Fold from the outside in towards the centre. I'm just going to shape it roughly into a loaf type shape. There we go. I'm going to leave the proof. It's not going to get to quite twice the size, but should um, almost double in size. And then I'm going to bake it for about 35 to 40 minutes on 180. And the temperature at which you bake these things is significant as well. If you put it straight into a hot oven, like maybe a 200 or 220, then that will really crust up the outside. So I wanted a really crusty bed, bread, um, then I'd put it on a really high temperature to increase the crust. I may put some moisture in there as well to create some steam in the oven. Like if you squirt some water, you get steam. That also helps create a really nice crust. But for this one, it's all about the softness. So I'm going to go on a 180, which should help to create a softer crust on the outside to help make the overall bread as soft as possible. So I'm going to leave this now for about another half an hour, and I'm going to bake it. And we're back. And look at that. Our bread has risen beautifully the second time around. So what I'm gonna do now is pop it in the oven for about 40 minutes, there or thereabouts. So it's nice and, and, and brown on top. I'm gonna to take it out, keep it cool, see what it's like. And here we are. Boom. I wish you could smell this. Oh, this smells so good. Now, the hardest thing to do when bread first comes out of the oven is to resist eating it straight away. Oh my goodness. A bit left in here. Now, even though when fresh bread comes out of the oven, the desire really is to just tear it apart straight away. If you can have some discipline, then let it cool. For two reasons. One, hot bread fresh out of the oven isn't the best for you. It's more difficult for our bodies to digest. That's a good reason to leave it. Secondly, the second legitimate reason is the fact that when bread first comes out of the oven, the insides, uh, when you try and cut it, they can often seem a bit softer, a bit doughy, because there's all the heat and all the water still trying to evaporate out. So I'm going to try and leave this. I say try. Because it smells so good. I'm going to try and leave this for about half an hour or so, let it fully cool down. Then we're going to cut it up uh, and see what it looks like on the inside. So here we are. 
Now I think I've been pretty patient because I've let this, I've waited until the bread's cooled a bit. It's not completely cool yet, but come on, I am only human. This smells incredible. So here we are, the softest wholemeal bread in the world, and that's like an official title. But don't take my word for it. Let me cut into this so I can show you just exactly what this is like on the inside. And this is actually gonna be my dinner. So, woo, proof of the pudding as always. Let's give it a cut and see what it's like. My days. People, you thought I was playing, didn't you? You thought I was playing. You thought I was playing, didn't you? You are not ready for bread this soft. This bread is almost too soft. This is 100% wholemeal bread, and it is basically, virtually too soft. It's almost too soft to cut. Oh, my days. People, you thought I was kidding, didn't you? This is super duper soft. That's why I call it the softest wholemeal bread recipe in the world. You are never gonna find wholemeal bread softer than this. Oh, this is really, really soft bread. This could be the softest wholemeal bread I've ever actually made. Smells incredible. I'm salivating just I'm getting ready to eat it. Let me let's just taste this. Shouldn't be a surprise to me because I've made bread before, but each time I use a particular recipe and this particular method, I kind of am surprised at just how soft it comes out. This is super, super soft. This is softer than even white bread, which makes me think: if I made the same bread, the same bread, the same technique with white flour, then I'd have the softest white flour bread in the world, back universe. Hmm. This is absolutely. Delicious. So there we have it. Mm. The softest wholemeal bread, literally, in the entire world. That's not a boast, that's just a scientific fact. Oh man. That's gonna be my dinner. Now to make my sandwich. So for my vegan mayo. A little bit of butter on my bread. For the butter, it's so soft that even the margarine is struggling to spread. Wow, this is crazy. The bread's too soft for the margarine, people. You're not ready for bread that soft, for real. And look at me, I'm being straight with you, I'm trying to be real. You're not ready for bread that soft. Bread too soft for margarine. This is like our vegan boiled egg, so to speak. So it's just tofu, bit of garlic, some seasoning, uh, cooked, up in a, cooked up in a pan. And to that, I'm gonna add some vegan mayonnaise. This, this is some I made the other day. And I'll post a video of how I made um, the vegan mayonnaise. Mm. So I'm add the vegan mayonnaise. Mix that in. It's almost like a vegan egg mayo. To give it a little bit of kick, I'm gonna add a little bit of uh, whole mustard. Give my mayo a little bit of bite. Oh, that's looking good. No, a little touch of marmite. So I'm gonna put a little touch of marmite. No way, my bread's too soft for the marmite. No way. You're not ready for bread this soft. Next, I'm gonna put on my, my vegan egg mayonnaise. Oh, my days! This looks legit. I'm gonna top that off 
with some watercress. Interesting thing about watercress, I mean, is that when you buy it, normally we just cut it off and then throw the rest away. Um, but as I discovered, if you cut this stuff off, it just keeps growing. A little bit of salt. And there we have it. I told you, the softest wholemeal bread in the world. Once again, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Food Tech 101 is now also on Facebook and Instagram. As always, my name is Mr. Liebird, or you can call me Sir. Of things we know.